Britain has become one of the world's least God-fearing countries. Every year, more and more of us come to the view that God and everything about him, a sense of mystery, intuition, blind faith, is to be rejected in favor of an understanding of the world that is based on the observable and the knowable. It's no surprise when you look around the world that atheism has become so attractive. But at its worst, atheism can be every bit as intolerant as the most devout religious belief. I wonder if it really is the answer to our prayers. If you believe you have God on your side, if you are the chosen ones, any act of barbarism can be justified against your enemies. It's not just Muslims versus the rest either. In Iraq, it's Muslims versus Muslims, Sunni versus Shia. In Northern Ireland, Christian sectarianism is a partial justification for decades of violence. The Zionists of Israel believe they have a God-given right to occupy land Palestinians believe to be theirs. The reciprocal loathing between Jews and Muslims is yet another gift from God, of course. No surprise, then, what the average man or woman in the liberal West makes of religion. What do you think about religion? About religion? Yeah. I think religion causes a lot of problems, really. I think what, what religion's managed to do through history has been to the detriment of freedom and, you know, and I think it holds people back. What do you think about people who say that religion causes a lot of warfare and trouble? It most probably does. Why do you think that is? Well, because you've got one person believing in one thing and one person believing in something else. And they feel, you know, they're passionate about what they believe in. Yeah, well, I suppose most wars are caused by religion, aren't they? Yeah. All of which is perfectly understandable, I suppose, but is it religion, per se, which is to blame? Or that very stupid human craving for certainty and justification? On the toes of theology. Many atheists reckon it is religion, a belief in the supernatural. The time has come for people of reason to say enough is enough. Religious faith discourages independent thought, it's divisive, and it's dangerous. Richard Dawkins is a brilliant man, a wonderful writer and, lest these days we forget, a fairly decent scientist too. Of late he has become more renowned though as the man who hates God, forever waging war on religion and blaming it for much of the violence in the world. It could be Muslim imams issuing fatwas. I think that the crimes that are done in the name of religion really do follow from religious faith. I don't think anybody ever could or would say that with respect to atheism. And not just Dawkins either. It seems to be de rigueur for card-carrying atheists to say that people who believe in religion are simply conditioned. I do object to people being entrapped by religious belief. And I think that such but people not should be disabused. They're not stupid. Do you think they're more stupid than you are? Well, clearly not. Um, I think they are conditioned more than I am. Some atheists have become rather dogmatic, terribly certain in their conviction that there is no God and that anyone who thinks there is, is a deluded and dangerous fool. And are they right? If we all became atheists tomorrow, would the world suddenly become a better place? Yeah. I doubt it. Not least because atheists are becoming as intransigent about their own views as the people they so despise. Atheism is becoming a religion of its own. It already has its gurus and its revered sacred texts. We will be able to explain everything through science. It has its magnificent temples, within which lie mysteries and unknowable truths. Here is where we uncover the laws of physics, the origin of the universe and its evolution. 
But of course, atheism too has blood on its hands. The Soviet Union's atheist regime killed more than 20 million people. When you think about it, atheism's a rather peculiar thing. Nothing more, really, than a belief in a negative. A further belief, if you like, in disbelief. So it's hard to imagine how such a blank position could show us how to live our lives. And yet that's exactly what some atheists are increasingly attempting to do. And in that attempt, atheism is beginning to take on some of the characteristics of the belief systems they despise. I think the idea Sorry, Ellen. <laughs> you just said they'll follow whatever rubbish you put in front of them. That their ideas are stupid. The beliefs are stupid. The theology is stupid. Isn't that a tad arrogant? Heartland, USA. A place where the equally intransigent forces of Christianity and atheism square up to one another. Sunday morning out. David Bedford is such a good atheist he changed his name to Darwin, much as an Islamic convert may change his name to Muhammad. Interested in reading something? Go home, she said. Hello. Hello. Read, sir? Who are you? Can well, I have I your... I'm the atheist messiah. Are you really? Yes. How wonderful to meet you. Yeah. Tell me a little about what you believe in, why you're, why you're here. What I believe in is, well, uh, my, I don't believe in any gods. And I think uh, believing in things that aren't true affects uh, people's uh, thinking and people's lives. But why it. can't you believe what you believe and let other people believe what they want? Uh, because what they believe is wrong. <laughs> yes, but don't, you, don't you think that's a tad arrogant? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. It's a good in, answer. In fact, I don't think that we should tolerate religion at all. It would be unfair, of course, to suggest that atheists are all of that variety. Uh, I think prevalence of religious belief, particularly in the heartland of America, is almost unquestioned. Uh, and in his way, he is doing something <laughs> to make people question that belief, I suppose. So, even atheism's rational way still breeds its own brand of bona fide loonies. But atheism's common ground with religion doesn't stop there. Devout believers can be contemptuous of the views of other religions. Hello. The same can be said of a good few atheists. American atheists were set up in 1963 with the laudable aim of safeguarding the civil rights of atheists. Welcome to my office. It's President Ellen Johnson shows me around. Thank you. Uh, this is our library. And if you want to come into the stacks, the best room is probably here because there's room. And this is our history so that years from now the Christians can't rewrite atheist history. And what's interesting is that going back to the 1700s, religion was criticized. I, I just did a show on the viewpoint, reading from those books to show people. And this is their history, and it has to be preserved. Cold drinks, everybody, before we do? Ellen's invited me to appear on her TV show, The Atheist Viewpoint, which is transmitted on cable in 19 U.S. states, as well as on the Internet. It's uh, 25 minutes. That's fine. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Atheist Viewpoint. My name is Ellen Johnson. I'm the president of American Atheists. My guest here today is the award-winning journalist Rod Little. I rather liked Ellen. She was witty, clever, well-read. But underneath, you've got that sulfurous whiff of the true believer. Because uh, it strikes me as odd that atheists should need an organization to pledge the fact that they don't believe something. Well, it's more than just that. We have to work to present, prevent, uh, protect our civil rights and protect the separation of state and church. You in, in Ellen's fight for the separation of state and church seemed wholly commendable. The trouble is, 
She doesn't stop there. I mean, our nation, as you know, Rod, is one of the most religious nations mm. on earth. They've got their they've got their little logo on our money. They've got their they've got their uh, their their pledge in our pledge that this is one nation under a god. When they get them there, they it wasn't long before Alan's sensible, rational approach had descended into vilifying religious beliefs. The ordinary Christian will do, for the most part, what the they they will. They are not called followers for nothing. So do you think that's stupid? I would never, ever attack someone, make an ad hominem attack against somebody. Indeed. I think what the <laughs> idea is... Sorry, Alan. You just said they'll follow whatever rubbish you put in front of them. You want to be rude about it? That's being rude, rude about it. I'm trying to be polite about it. But what I will say is that their ideas are stupid. The beliefs are stupid. The theology is stupid. And boy, that half an hour goes fast, doesn't it, folks? I want to thank Rod Little for being a guest on the show and his thank crew here for much. being in the studio. Thanks yeah. for watching us on The Atheist Viewpoint. What you get when you talk to some atheists about religion isn't simply a dispassionate argument about the fact contempt. As if it's not enough that belief in a divine being might be improbable, but that it's actually laughable. It's the same when you speak to a fervent believer, that terrible certitude that he's right and you are wrong. And atheism has its triumphant evangelists, many living right here in the English countryside. We are entering the typical habitat of Britain's fundamentalist atheists. Quiet country lane on the fringes of a cathedral city. Agreeable cottages, privet and leylandy. Peter Atkins is a professor at Oxford University. He believes God is an unnecessary human creation. I can see that there's an argument for that. Give me your views on the existence or otherwise of God. Well, it's fairly straightforward. There isn't one. There's no evidence for one, no reason to believe that there is one. And so I don't believe that there is one. And I think it's rather foolish of people to think that there is one. Isn't there a terrible arrogance in that certitude? What's wrong with arrogance if you're right? I can't, I don't know that I mean, it's not quite sartorially your style. But for Richard Dawkins, being an atheist means replacing irrational, faith-based understanding with science and the scientific method. Uh, very nice. The science has standards of peer review, standards of testing, things have to be verified. It's not enough for somebody to say, um, I believe that so-and-so, or it feels good to me. You wouldn't take very seriously a scientist who said, an asteroid hit the Earth because I just feel that way, or it has been privately revealed to me that an asteroid hit the Earth. The atheist would argue that the scientific method gives us all we need in order to make sense of the world, and that science, with its rational explanations based upon observable evidence, isn't merely a superior tool for understanding, but the only tool. In other words, it is the way, the truth, and the light. Now, does that sound familiar? The problem for atheists is that science may not be as far away from religion as you might imagine. This is the Fermilab in Batavia, Illinois, a beautiful early 1970s temple to science. Its job is to tell us how the universe began, although like the Latin or Greek of early religious texts, not in a language many would understand. Rocky Kolb is one of their elders, a man at the top of his profession who knows more about the origin of the universe than almost anyone else. So the, these are all the controls for the linear accelerator. Fermilab contains the most powerful particle accelerator in the world. 
Inside it, particles are smashed together at velocities close to the speed of light to try to replicate the moment when the universe came into being. This is science at its most magnificent and exalted. It is uh, 6.28 kilometers in circumference. And matter and antimatter collide at two places around the ring. When they collide, they produce the same conditions we believe were present a millionth of a millionth of a second after the bang. After the bang. After the bang. And we recreate the conditions as close to the time of the bang as we can do. Using the results of when asked what happened after the Big Bang, Rocky could tell me down to the minutest detail. But of course, when it came to what happened before, he ran into trouble. It's also interesting that your ambition at the moment cannot reach beyond that 100 millionth of a second after the Big Bang. You can't go before there. Why can't you? Oh, well, we can certainly speculate about what happened before that. But it's speculation, informed scientific speculation, but speculation. It is informed scientific speculation. That's correct. Does any of what you've discovered actually preclude the existence of a creator? No, there's nothing to preclude it, and yet there's nothing that suggests the necessity of it. Which option you take then, God or no God, is a matter of choosing something for which there is no scientific proof either way. Sir John Polkinghorne is one of the great theoretical physicists of the 20th century. He's now retired from science and is an Anglican priest. In, in that respect. He believes that God stands apart from physics. I don't think that God is scientifically knowable, or the non-existence of God would be scientifically knowable. I think that the character of the world is supportive of the idea that there is a divine mind and purpose behind it, but I don't think it, I don't think it can be amount to, to proof that that's so. I think that none of us have access to knock down proofs of that, that character, whether we're theists or whether we're atheists. What do you say to pretty eminent scientists who have a belief in God? That they're wrong, first of all. Well, you don't, uh, again, let, let, let's go back, you don't actually think that, do you? Because you cannot... Well, quite, I think they're wrong. You cannot quite... Can think ex- that. You can think that, and yes. You might ask, what is the psychology behind my thinking that? <laughs> that is an interesting meta question and so on. But um, it's, it's a, if, if you like, it's a sadness that clearly the reason that these very eminent people, some of whom no doubt you've been been talking to, um, uh, are only half scientists, really. Some atheists argue that scientists who believe in God are guilty of dualism. That is, they understand the world in two different contradictory ways, one which is scientific and rational, the other of which is intuitive and involves a belief in the supernatural. But I don't see that as a contradiction. In fact, that balance strikes me as being at the very essence of what it is to be human. You cannot live by cold logic alone. Cold logic and science can't actually disprove God, but fervent tastes nevertheless feel their position is the only rational one. I don't think you can disprove God, as you can't disprove fairies and unicorns. And so I suppose it is right that it's a kind of scientific purism that makes me say I can't disprove God, therefore I I can't be an absolute 100% atheist. I mean, I I treat God as the same as fairies and unicorns. But you are 100% really, aren't you? I'm the same as I am with fairies. Another problem for atheists is that modern physics, far from doing away with the idea of God, may even in glimpse of his hand at work. He believes, he, of course... Oh, there are other... Bernard Carr is a cosmologist and studies how the laws of physics operate in the universe. He says that the laws of nature are so finely tuned to enable complex life to exist that it is extremely unlikely that this could be believes at least raises the possibility of a tuner. 
This is a diagram, it's called the pyramidal complexity, and what we've got here, we've got the different levels of structure in the universe, and at the bottom we've got the things like quarks that make up the atoms, and the atoms build up to make molecules, the molecules build up to make living cells, the cells make organisms, and eventually we end up with brains and consciousness. It's rather hard to, to you know, estimate what the probability is, but it was clearly very, very unlikely that those coincident, those fine tunings which allowed this pyramid of complexity to arise would be there. How did this come about, this, this rather terrific luck? Of course, one of the first explanations that comes to mind is that there was a tuner or a creator or, if you like, God. And obviously for people of a theological disposition, the idea that the fine tuning is evidence of God, of course, is wonderful. But of course there are other exciting explanations as to why our universe is so finely tuned. One such idea is the multiverse. We have the possibility that our universe might just be one of, of many, many other universes. This is called the multiverse. To the average layperson, uh, the notion of the multiverse stretches the imagination to a far greater degree even than the notion of a divine creator. Well, that's a very interesting point, because if you do have millions of other universes, if you do have this multiverse, it's clear that you no longer need the creator because you can simply say it's a selection effect that we have to be in one of the universes which allows us life to arise. Now, in that sense, I think you might say that the, the multiverse is the last refuge of the atheist. The multiverse is one of several atheist explanations for why we're here, but to me they're all about as provable as God or transubstantiation. Modern physics, however, is not the denomination of science which most excites the atheist. That place is occupied by a text that now has the status of a new, New Testament. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. It is a fundamental reason why many become atheists in the first place. When did you first become an atheist? And I think I became an atheist properly at the age of about 16 or 15. And what was it? I, I suppose it was really understanding Darwin. Arguably there has been no greater scientific discovery in the last 150 years than Charles Robert Darwin's astonishing realisation of how complex life forms evolve through a painstaking process of accumulation from the very, very simplest of stuff. And of course it's this which has formed the main battleground between those scientists who see no room for religion in the world and those who can accommodate both a scientific and religious worldview. For a century and a half, Darwinism has been atheism's trump card. But today, even its strongest tenet is under threat. How long do you think it'll take before Darwin is actually comprehensively rewritten and it is accepted as such? That's an interesting question. It could be rather rapidly. All major religions have insisted that man occupies a special place in God's realm. Darwin changed all that. He put mankind back into nature, a creature different from the beasts of the field, only through a complex, natural process. He was taking on the religious establishment and inadvertently giving atheism its first sacred text. Darwin brilliantly swept away that previously incontestable Christian truth that an organ as complex as, say, an eye could not possibly have arisen by chance. There must have been design. And Darwin argued, no, of course it's not chance. It's a gradual process of accumulation. In other words, he took on religious thought on its own grounds and won. And that's why atheists return to Darwin. The importance of Darwin to atheists cannot be overstated. Steve Fuller, a philosopher of science from Warwick University, 
believes Darwin lies at the centre of modern atheist thought. Well, if you uh, ask about the relationship between uh, Darwinism and atheism, uh, I think it's a very clear connection, especially if we think about atheism as a, as a view that's against any kind of uh, belief in a supernatural personal deity that's involved with sort of planning uh, a created universe. Darwinism uh, clearly denies that. It's not clear, uh, at least to my mind, on what other basis especially scientifically credible bases one could have uh, for atheism. Because of Darwinism's importance to the atheist project, it's not surprising that many apply it to much more than just biology. Darwinian thinking is even used to describe the creation, evolution and survival of atheism's great nemesis, religion. Let me give you an example. One explanation thought up by Richard Dawkins was the concept of the meme. That might have got better anyway. A meme is a cultural virus that survives down the generations infecting everybody it comes across. The religion meme survives not because it's true, but because it serves a useful purpose of providing comfort. If you look at what uh, religions have in common, it very often is um, qualities which enable it to get passed on. Faith is a good thing. Mystery is something you shouldn't try to investigate. Uh, when you die, you will survive your own death. These are all viral ideas which are, which are eminently spreadable, either because they have a kind of inherent These spreadability in their own life. You could call them memes. They're in, they, either they have inherent spreadability or they are very appealing and they spread because they're appealing. But is this Darwinian metaphor an accurate way of describing religion? I went to meet Dennis Alexander, an immunologist and practicing Christian, to see what he makes of it. Yeah, yeah. So far as I understand the explanation, it's that God, for example, has been able to replicate itself down the years like a virus. Do, do you find that a compelling argument? I, well, not really. I, th I think that, you know, in science we use a lot of metaphors. We use metaphors all the time. And the point about metaphors is they get taken on by the scientific community because they're really useful. They do actual work. You know, I mean, physicists talk about black holes and things like that, and we know what a black hole is. I think the problem about a meme is it doesn't actually tell us anything. Um, it's a sort of vacuous concept because it doesn't really apply to anything that we know about in real life. It's certainly nothing like a virus. I mean, it's nothing like, you know, the way a virus gets into a cell. Um, so people don't really think that these beliefs kind of infect them secretly during the... This idea of a mean to explain away religion is a good example of the atheist commitment to Charles Darwin. But I think they're pushing Darwinism too far, and I'm not alone. My concern about this is that it seems to be a scientific theory being expanded way, way beyond its acceptable intended limits. Darwinism here is not simply a philosophy of the emergence of biological species, but rather a way of understanding everything. Darwinism is universal. That's a very interesting position. It's one that I personally have some difficulty with because I certainly do not see the, the Darwinian paradigm operating, for example, in the history of ideas. Day by day, the limits of Darwinism are becoming increasingly clear. Atheists hold on to the central idea of Darwinist evolution with quasi-religious fervor. But the fact is that the theory is getting on a bit. It's now 147 years old. And as with religion's ancient texts, many of today's scientists are finding holes in it. This is the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Its fossil collection is seen by some scientists as challenging Darwin's theory of evolution. And Professor Jeffrey Schwartz is a scientist who is turning Darwinism on its head. You might think he's a member of the evangelical religious right, but he's actually an agnostic. Here we see... Um... Schwartz says the fossil record suggests that species can appear suddenly. 
What's interesting is that if we look at this specimen here, this is actually a cast of the most famous specimen, the first specimen of Archaeopteryx. Sure, yes. And this has some features of dinosaur kind of things, if you will. Uh, it has tooth jaws. You can't see it in here. It still had teeth. You can see the feathers. So Darwin used Archaeopteryx as an example of an intermediate, something that's between reptiles and birds. Others said, no, this is just there, you know, popped out of nowhere. So the thing is that intermediate is really in the eye of the beholder. And um, Schwartz uses a modern understanding of genes to explain how new features, or novelties, appear suddenly as opposed to through gradual evolution. The theory that I, I proposed is that um, a so-called mutation in the broadest sense arises usually in the unexpressed or recessive state. And in modern biology, biological language, we would say inactive spread silently through the population until you have individuals with a copy of this novel potential for novelty and then they produce offspring that has both copies boom you get it you get it so within this, one generation yes the spread of the potential for novelty may take several generations the appearance of the novelty is like that An hour from West Virginia the dramatic point about the good professor's theory is that Darwin can only explain how novelty evolves not where it originates from. The same applies to entire species. You could rewrite Darwin's most famous work on the origin of adaptation by means of natural selection. The Darwinian theory is that selection causes the feature to appear. But in fact, a feature can only have selection act on it once it appears. How long do you think it'll take before uh, Darwin is actually comprehensively rewritten? and it is accepted as such? That's an interesting question. It could be rather rapidly, but there are people, there are people in geology. Professor Schwartz's theories, of course, do not imply the existence of a divine creator, but they do rip at the heart of those evolutionists who use Darwinist theory to explain everything very simply as a gradual procession with a purpose. I'm pretty sure that sooner or later Darwin's theory will be superseded. Science is a wonderful human creation for explaining the world, but it is almost always incomplete. Its theories, which were once considered pure fact, revised or discarded. It's known as paradigm shift. One of the most fascinating things about the history of science is the idea of the paradigm shift. That scientists thought in one way and then the force of evidence came to a point where they were forced to review things radically and start seeing things in a very different direction. The fact that science keeps changing means that its conclusions can never be absolutely certain. But what is important to atheists is not the conclusions but the scientific method. Science does not know everything now. It doesn't know everything, but it's got an extraordinarily potent method, and everything it touches gives way. I mean, that's the extraordinary thing about science. You identify a problem, you bring this, the scientific method to, to bear on it, and it crumbles in, in front of your approach. It's a wonderful method, and humanity should be proud that it stumbled on a technique for discovering the truth. For 3,000 years, it, it, it thought it had a method of, of, of getting the truth, and it called it religion, but you know, that's obviously impotent as a, a way of discovering anything about the world. But the past has shown that the tools of the scientific method, logic, reason and evidence, don't always lead to a better world. In 1865, Darwin's half-cousin, Francis Galton, took the logical step and applied Darwin's theory of natural selection to human beings. Using logic and reason, Galton came up with a theory called eugenics, and the results were a bit worrying. Galton's career is unimaginable without Darwin's work for seen. He's directly inspired by the origin of species, and he's directly inspired because Darwin clearly implies that the theory applies to humans as much as it does to the animal and plant kingdom. 
And the problem is this, is that although evolution proceeds by natural selection, civilized society, civilization, negates natural selection. So Darwin says... How we, does it? Well, the, the sick, the, the lame, uh, the feeble-minded, says Darwin, are protecting civilized society. And so... Galton and eugenics is the solution to that, if you like. It's saying... Which is not to care about them. Not necessarily not to care about them, but certainly to restrict their breeding. Because otherwise, and Darwin explicitly recognises this in The Descent of Man, there's a danger that the unfit will outbreed the fit. And natural selection and the evolutionary process will go into reverse. Golden tried to develop scientific techniques to identify the unwanted in society by their physical traits. What he did is he went around collecting photographs of various types of criminals in the hope of being able to discover common physical traits between them. And what, what are these photographs of? These are of various different categories as well. In, in 1885 he does a study of Jewish boys. One chap who found such ideas particularly compelling was Adolf Hitler. David Stack runs a course called From Darwin to Death Camps. He believes the Nazis took Galton's ideas one step further, using them to justify the extermination of Jews. Is there a direct line between Darwin, Galton and Hitler? There's a direct line. Is Darwin responsible for what happens under the Nazis? Not. No. Is there an intellectual connection? Then yes. Darwin removes the spirituality of mankind. He places man within nature. Once you do that, then you can begin to regard man as, of, as you regard animals and as you regard the plant kingdom. You'll find very few good-minded liberal atheists arguing the case for eugenics these days. But why not? What's the matter, boys? Scientifically, it is, after all, very difficult to argue against. But something stops us clamouring for the compulsory sterilisation of mentally handicapped people. Something perhaps unscientific. That something is called morality. The fact that atheists have to confront is a terrible one. The scientific method is, by definition, supposedly disinterested and neutral. So, if you rely on science to tell you how to live your life, where do you look for moral guidance? Natural selection and survival of the fittest are the only moral imperatives that can be adduced from Darwinism. Unsurprisingly, not many atheists fancy that approach to morality. And so atheism's big thinkers are working hard to find a moral code that is based on reason. Peter Singer is one of atheism's greatest ethical philosophers. Lovely to me. Where, where do you think we derive ethics from? I think essentially we get ethics when we take a wider point of view, when we don't just think of our own selfish interests, but when we think of the interests of a larger group. So we're sort of putting ourselves in the position of, of taking an impartial view as to what should or shouldn't be done. Your view of ethics presumably means a moral code which uh, necessarily changes. The overall moral principle that says you should do what has the best consequences never changes. But, of course, in different circumstances, a particular action will have different consequences. But doesn't that lead to a moral vacuum? No, I don't think it leads to a moral vacuum. Uh, I think it leads to um, a more reflective uh, morality, one that is held perhaps in a somewhat more tentative way. A tentative morality is also what we find in Richard Dawkins' latest entertaining excursion into religion bashing, the God Delusion. In it, Dawkins kindly comes up with his own new set of Ten Commandments. You have to say, they lack a certain rigour. 
you uh, replace the Ten Commandments with your own Ten Commandments, which I have to say look rather wishy-washy, here today, gone tomorrow. Isn't the great thing about religion that it has given us a longevity of moral behaviour? Well, I'm astonished you should think that was a good thing, I mean, because, because you actually look at, at, the, at the morality that comes out of the Old Testament, everybody's appalled by it, I mean, just about everybody's appalled by it. The here's a day, gone tomorrow thing, I actually rather agree with that, and that's one of the points I'm trying to make, that there is what I call a, a steadily shifting moral zeitgeist. Well, this might sound well and good in principle, but the track record of societies that have done away with the moral certitudes of religion is far from ideal. Back in the 18th century, a group of French revolutionaries, the Jacobins, did away with Christianity and sought to build a society based on rational thought. It ended in extreme violence. Well, the first attempt to create a society consciously without God was made by the Jacobins in France in the 1790s with their cult of reason. It was part of a broader desire to sort of purify society. I mean, these were people sort of deadly moralists, as it were. And, um, you know, in order to implement their moral vision on Earth, uh, they essentially tried to destroy Christianity. The Jacobins' moral position left them in no doubt as to what to do with their ideological enemies. In Western France alone, they killed about a quarter of a million people who had attempted to adhere to the old religion. The Jacobins weren't having this. They just slaughtered them. The Jacobins were not unique. Burley points out that societies which have rejected God have not escaped mankind's violent nature. I think if you subtract God and you subtract the notion of an afterlife, then there is a real risk, particularly in the political utopianisms, uh, which we saw, which was so deadly in the 20th century, um, there's a real risk that you will attempt to create heaven on earth, go for a quick fix in the here and now, to have the arrogant illusion that you can remake man and woman into some sort of new being, and that invariably results in hell for ordinary people. This is Vladimir Nikiforov, a Catholic priest who is chaplain at Royal Holloway College. He lived through this very same kind of hell in his Russian homeland, which was then a Marxist utopia based on reason. In 1974, Vladimir was drawn to God and became a Christian. Unfortunately for him, this put him on the wrong side of the communist state. I was secretly ordained priest in an um, organized community, also a clandestine community in Moscow. Um, that was in violation of the state laws. Atheism has been an integral part of all communist states. The party demanded atheism in its rules, you can't be a party member if you're a member of any religion, actually. Do you think that that secularism can be as brutal as religious fundamentalism? Well, it has been. Going back to the communist state, when the state wanted to exterminate religious groups, it did that with much cruelty. So if we are talking about the um, crimes of militant secularism, the list can be very, very, very long fascism, communism, they were secular ideologies, basically. And look what they did. Uh, so, in this case, who is talking? We, all, we are all uh, ideologists or religions, we all have criminal record in the past, and we should be humble about that, I suppose. Atheists don't go out to kill for other people's beliefs. Forgive me for, for mentioning Hitler. Stalin, Catholic. Mao. No, they weren't. Um, Stalin killed 20 million people. Yeah, but he was a Confucian. Oh, come on. That is, <laughs> that is wriggling of, of, the, of yeah. the most ludicrous kind. Yeah, but so it was an atheistic but, system. Yeah, but they don't go out to kill on, in the name of atheism that um, Stalin was an atheist. Uh, Stalin didn't do his dreadful deeds in the name of atheism. He did them in the name of, well, a kind of Marxism. But, but surely that's the crucial point, that once one particular set of values 
has been removed, one way of living, um, another one has to fill its place. Well, We're human beings, right. and that's what we do. Yes, well, is there a sort of vacuum which needs to be filled when, when religion goes? Um, th that is arguable. It is possible that, that humans are so weak that they actually do need something like a religion. And if you sweep away Christianity, what you're going to get is something like Stalinist Marxism. The events of the last century should have taught us that countries which adopt secular ideologies can reach heights of cruelty, bigotry and repression which had hitherto been unimaginable. The point being that once you get rid of the religion, you don't get rid of the bigotry and the violence. To me, it is clear that a society built on science and reason will not automatically result in the utopian vision which atheists dream of. Because when you take God out of the equation, you've still got the problem of human nature. Now it's not religion, it's not anti-religion, it's not politics that's the problem. It's human nature itself. That things that inspire us, that we feel are really, really important, may make us do some very, very good things. But on the other hand, they make us do some very bad things as well. Atheists have become terribly preoccupied with destroying God and religion. And it's the absolute certitude with which they do this and the contempt sprayed upon those who fail to share their disbelief that worries me a little bit. History has shown us that it's not religion so much that's a problem, but any system of thought which insists that one group of people are inviolably in the right, whereas the others are in the wrong and thus must somehow be punished. The true scientific position, of course, is that there may be a God. And there may not be a God. Why can't we leave it at that?